Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. <clears throat> As we look to open the word of the Lord today and the word of his prophet, <clears throat> shall we ask for his guidance and for his direction so that in unity we may come to a clearer understanding of that which he would have us to understand for this time in our history and for this time in this world's history. Shall we ask for his guidance? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these hours of the Sabbath. We thank you for the opportunity we have to open your word, to learn, and to be guided. I thank you for each one that is here today, Father, and for those that will view this later. Help us now, Father, as we begin this study, that we may together walk at the path that you would set before us that we may together learn what you would have us to learn for this time so that that which we do and this that you would direct us to do would bring glory to your name and honor to your character. Be with us now. May your angels attend us. May your spirit guide us. Help us so that that which we need to know, we may come to know. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Before us, we have the opening of Zephaniah chapter 2. As we see, the first verse is an exhortation to repentance. Now we have, from verse 4 on, the judgment upon the Philistines, the judgment upon Moab and Ammon, the judgment upon Ethiopia, and the judgment upon Assyria. In the modern translations, they would call this judgment upon Judah's enemies. If we were to look at this symbolically, how many nations <clears throat> are there now listed for judgment in this chapter? You have five there. Exactly. And those that are of Judah are being called to repentance. Symbolically, are we not being called to repentance? And if, yes. not, and if not symbolically, are we not literally being called to repentance? So as the verses read, gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation, not desired. Does any other verse in the Old Testament give a better description to the movement than this one? For is this movement today desired within the church? Is this movement today desired within the world? We are yet told, though, to gather yourselves together. Yea, gather together. Is this not a type of a doubling, a repeat are we not being told that we are to gather together? And have we not been told in other scriptures, forsake not yourselves in gathering together? 
Are we not to gather together to give worship to the Lord? We are to gather together before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Now, it's kind of interesting, this word gather together. Okay. You know, I'm just reading it here in the King James. I don't think you get a sense of it. Um. Now, the word itself, according to Brown Drivers Briggs, um, is, uh, well, it's kashash, which doesn't really mean anything. It's just how it's pronounced. Uh, but it means to gather, assemble, collect, gather stubble or sticks, to gather, like, so like straw, the gathering of straw. Um, what this reminds me of is um, in Prism B. So this is uh, uh, a prism that is a, a, a memorial stone that was um, found in Babylon, the one that has Manessa on it. It's a, it's a, it's a message from Esar Hadon, who took Manessa captive to Babylon. He's the king of Assyria, of course, and he brought him to Babylon in 677, as we know. And he wrote an account of this. And um, the word that he used, well, it was an Assyrian word, uh, um, I can't remember it offhand, but it, it means to gather or assemble uh, people or armies or straw or building materials. Um, and, and that's sort of the idea here, this gather yourselves together. Um, now, the idea here is this is reflexive. So uh, to gather oneself together, it's the Hebrew form of the word. So, so they're gathering themselves together, but they're gathering themselves together like you would gather um, stubble or sticks. I mean, obviously, it can you be used for assembly as well? But, but when you see there, before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as, as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord, um, you know, I'm kind of trying to wonder what this gathering together is about. I mean, because I would first think of it as more like the upper room sort of experience, but I'm not sure if that's what it means in the, in the context of which, in which this is more like huddling together to be protected from something that's going to come upon you. I don't know. It's just a, it just seems like a strange word. It wouldn't be usually the word that is used in the context of something like this at least how i would look at it um, right so it's the same word used in exodus when it came to gathering the straw and um and uh, also used in numbers when they gathered the sticks uh, uh, but it's not the same word <clears throat> where they were to gather the manna no. No. Um, there's a man that gathered sticks on the Sabbath day, right? And yes. they had been gathering sticks. The sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. Numbers 1533. Um, and then uh, uh, so there, that he gathers sticks, right? So mostly it's just used for like gathering sticks together or straw. Um, right, so the idea of using it to um, gather people together just seems kind of strange. But when you bring up Numbers 1533, yeah, is this not also showing that God is jealous for his law? Yeah. And would that also not have <clears throat> an interrelation to the 1,335 that we would find in Daniel. Yeah. Well, and also, um, this is going to be the year in which the Exodus occurs, 1533. Right. So, so the <clears throat> um, 
And and this, of course, uh, you know, when they have this in Numbers 15, um, uh, you're going to have, um, trying to figure out which, where exactly this occurs. Yeah, because this story is kind of put in there. Uh, I don't know exactly when this occurs. But in this in this situation, <clears throat> we are being given the admonition to gather together. Yeah. Before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. So we have one, two three, four different admonitions that before the decree bring forth, before the day passes the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Um, now, I mean, you see the second before there is actually added. Correct. So, I mean, I would see this more as three, not four. Well, before, the reason... yeah, because in, in Hebrew, it really wouldn't read that. Uh, because it'd be more like before the day of the decree um, come, is brought forth. Uh, or So... Well, is this verse, Zephaniah 2, verse 2, 22, mm -hmm. as we have seen in the study of Joseph, mm -hmm. 220, as we have come to accept as being a representation of mm -hmm. restoration and reunion. Is it possible that this is also giving reference to the messages of Revelation 14 and 18. Mm. In because because of the four, or what are you what are you trying to say? It can be because of either the three or the four. Well, I don't know. For when does when does God's judgment come upon the world? Well, at the end of the world. <laughs> but we're we are told though, fear God, give glory to him, for the <clears throat> hour of his judgment is come. Yeah, you know, that's the judgment upon the church, not upon the world. Right, that's the investigative judgment, the day of atonement where God's people are judged. That there's one before the other. Now, the different verses that the translators had used here would take us to Job, but also to Second Kings, along with Psalms, Isaiah, and Hosea. At the very first, when we are being told to gather together, O nation not desirous, the reference is given to Joel 2, verse 16. If we rearrange the numbers, we have a 126. Also, 216 is 6 times 6 times 6. Okay. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. 
We're given very specific steps. We're given very specific admonitions here. Job 21.18 They are as stubble before the wind and as chaff that the storm carrieth away. Psalm 1.4 The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff and the wind driveth away. <clears throat> so the ungodly are like the chaff that the wind driveth away what wind are they talking about what storm is carrying away the chaff the nation shall rush like the rushing of many waters but God shall rebuke them and they shall flee far off and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. Hosea 13.3 Therefore they shall be as the morning cloud, and as the early dew that passes away, as the chaff that is driven <clears throat> with the whirlwind out of the floor, and as the smoke out of the chimney. Notwithstanding, the Lord turneth not of the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah, because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him withal. Here we are given, again, a reference to Manasseh. We are being shown that those that are on the ungodly are not fruitful. They are chaff. They are just those that would be driven away by the wind. Now, of these initial verses, seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Why are we to seek meekness? What does this mean for us today? What is our Heavenly Father trying to say to us? For Manuscript 3, 1861, <clears throat> Mrs. White writes, Those who are so ignorant of the grace of God upon the heart should in humility learn of Christ and should be very modest in their conversation. They had better be reserved about introducing the truth to unbelievers until they can adorn it by good fruits and by their daily walk show that they have been learning of him who is meek and lowly of heart. So um, uh, Webster's uh, defines meekness as uh, softness of temper, mildness, gentleness, forbearance under injuries and provocations. It says in the evangelical in the evangelical sense, humility, resignation, submission to the divine will, without murmuring or peevishness, opposed to pride, arrogance, and refractoriness. And that they he references Galatians five twenty three. In that, that's the eighteen twenty three Webster's definition. Isn't that interesting? <clears throat> how it shows a meekness, very much like the description that had been given of Moses. 
very much like the description that had been given of Father Miller. Very much like the descriptions that we see throughout Scripture of Christ. Amen. God requires his people to arise and shake up, shake off hindering clogs. And then when laborers come among them, they will be benefited and will not stop to notice this article of dress and that apron or bonnet. And all will take hold earnestly to arise. Each will attend to his and her own case. Are we responsible for the salvation of our brothers and our sisters? Or are we responsible for our own salvation first? Well, if we look at that, the last of that line that you read, each will attend to his or her own case. Yes. Um, you did read that, didn't you? Or was I reading that ahead of you? <laughs> no, no, I did read it. Um, so that would just tell me that we're all responsible for our own salvation. However, we also have some of the admonitions from her uh, regarding like William Miller and those responsible for turning him away from the word. Right. And they were responsible. So um, there are it's not a pat answer. <laughs> Each will attend to his or her own case. Uh, yes, in that respect. But we also have, you know, I mean, we can't blame somebody else for our our problems. No. Um, but God does. <laughs> well, we have, we have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. That's what it says. Absolutely, I agree. So in this, the prophets are subject to the prophets. They are all in agreement with each other. Amen. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Again, Zephaniah 2.3. The meek of the earth who keep God's commandments are here addressed. All should lay hold of the truth and let it elevate them. They should take hold of the work in earnest. Some are very fearful of being like the world. And those who express the most fear in this matter are those whose lives are not circumspect and a recommendation to their faith. Their fear should be exercised in a different direction. And they fear lest they give unbelievers occasion to speak reproachfully of our faith. We are now a sect everywhere spoken against. And we are by some accounted the offscoring of all things. Many unbelievers say it is only the weak-minded and the poor, low class of society, who believe these singular doctrines. And the inconsistent course of some professed Sabbath keepers gives them occasion to say such things. We are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels and to men, 1 Corinthians 4, 9. It is of the highest importance that Sabbath keepers live out their faith in every particular. They should be prompt and neat and keep their business matters all straight. If they believe the truth from the heart, they will do this. The truth will, if carried out, reform their lives. Evil angels crowd around them, pressing their darkness upon them, 
to shut out Jesus from their view. That their eyes might be drawn to the darkness that surrounds them. And they distrust God and next murmur against him. Their only safety was in keeping their eyes directed upward. Angels of God had charge over his people. And as the poisonous atmosphere from the evil angels was pressed around these anxious ones, the heavenly angels were continually wafting their wings over them to scatter the thick darkness. Some I saw did not participate in this work of agonizing and pleading. They seemed indifferent and careless. They were not resisting the darkness around them, and it shut them in like a thick cloud. The angels of God left these, and I saw them hastening to the assistance of those who were struggling with all their energies to resist the evil angels and trying to help themselves by calling upon God with perseverance. But the angels left those who made no effort to help themselves. And I lost sight of them. As the praying ones continued their earnest cries, a ray of light from Jesus would at times come to them to encourage their hearts and to lift up their countenances. When we see this, that there are some that were indifferent and careless and they were not resisting the darkness around them. I begin to think of the situation that we are told that there would be those that would be praying before the altar. They would not know that Christ had left the holy place. They would not know that Christ was then entering into the most holy place. They would not know that Christ had left them. And who stood before them? Who was it that now came before them? That was uh, Satan? Yes. Yeah, that would be Satan. There are those that are not resisting the darkness. So who are they not resisting? Satan. It is a fearful thing that they are not resisting Satan. For then we are shown that the angels of God have left them. Because these are not choosing to help themselves. I ask the meaning of the shaking I had seen. And was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear this straight testimony. They will rise up against it. And this will cause a shaking among God's people. What do we see as the straight testimony that is called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans? We're given an admonition about Laodicea. For we need ice out. We need gold tried in fire. We need the white raiment. We need the character of Christ. We need the pure gold of the word. 
that word that is refined by Miller's rules. For as a miller mills the grain to separate the wheat from the chaff, does not the fire separate the gold from the dross? And is not this ice out a healing message, a message so that our vision, our spiritual vision can again be healed? Father Miller gave us 14 rules. But was this of man's wisdom? Negative. How was this brought to William Miller? Through his uh, reading of scriptures. Okay, now I'm, I'm going to ask a question here. I agree with part of what you just said. There could be that angel too. <laughs> As we look at this, if we were to look upon the book of Revelation, Revelation 1.1 tells us the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he, Jesus Christ, sent and signified by his angel unto his servant John. Yeah, the angel, as I said. Right. And who is this angel? That would be Gabriel. So here we have Gabriel bringing the revelation to John. Gabriel bringing the revelation of the rules to William Miller. But where did these rules originate? God. Is there any higher authority in the universe than for Not this? Not my universe? knowledge. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, there's several that think they're God, but <laughs> no higher authority than he himself. So in this situation, when it is chosen to set aside Miller's rules, Whose rules are being set aside? That would be God. If we set aside God's rules, if we are so blind as to make that choice, are we not then choosing idolatry over true worship? Yes, amen. The testimony of the true witness has not been half heeded. The solemn testimony upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly esteemed, if not entirely disregarded. This testimony must work deep repentance, and all that truly receive it will obey it and be purified. Brothers and sisters, if the testimony has not been half heeded, it's being ignored. This same testimony is the destiny of the church. It is the destiny of the movement. It is being lightly esteemed. It is being lightly regarded if not entirely disregarded.
we have not been in unity because we have ignored the testimony of the true witness. We must accept that all that truly receive this testimony will obey it and will be purified. Are we not to be purified, made white, and tried? Are these three steps not incumbent upon our experience today? I'm assuming that it's almost mandatory to go through those three things. Okay. Again, gather yourselves together. Okay, gather together, O nation not desired. Before the decree bring forth, before the day passes the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought this, his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. We are near the close of time. I have been shown that the retributive judgments of God are already in the land. The Lord has given us warning of the events about to take place light is shining from his word yet darkness covers the earth and gross darkness the people while they shall cry peace and safety sudden destruction cometh upon them and they shall not escape Mrs. White was offering this as a testimony. Mrs. White offered this testimony in 1882, a year after the passing of her beloved husband, James. This testimony was given <clears throat> before the president of the general conference made his pronouncements about what was and was not inspired in God's word before Uriah Smith publicly came out attacking her testimonies and this would have been one that he would have attacked it is our duty to inquire the cause of this terrible darkness that we may shun the course by which men have brought upon themselves so great a delusion. God has given the world an opportunity to learn and obey his will. He has given them in his word the light of truth. He has sent them warning, counsel, and admonition, but few will obey his voice. Like the Jewish nation, <clears throat> the majority, even of professed Christians, pride themselves on their superior advantages, but make no returns to God for these great blessings in infinite mercy. A last warning message has been sent to the world announcing that Christ is at the door and calling attention to God's broken law. But as the antediluvians rejected with scorn the warning of Noah, so will the pleasure lovers of today reject the message of God's faithful servants. The world pursues its unvarying round, absorbed as ever in its business and its pleasure, while the wrath of God is about to be visited on the transgressors of his law. Again, fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. It is not yet to come. It is come now.
The exhortation of the prophet is, gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired, before the decree bring forth, before the day passes the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. It's interesting to me how many times this one verse was repeated within these testimonies of Mrs. White's. It's interesting because how often did she call the church of her time to repentance? And how often was those calls ignored? May the same not occur with us. In view of what is soon to come upon the earth, I entreat you, brethren and sisters, to walk before God in all meekness and lowliness of mind, remembering the care that Jesus has for you. All the meek of the earth are exhorted to seek him. Those who have wrought his judgments are to seek him. Let self break in pieces before God. It is hard to do this, but we are warned to fall upon the rock and be broken else it will fall upon us and grind us to powder. It is to the humble in heart that Jesus speaks. His everlasting arms encircle them, and he will not leave them to perish by the hands of the wicked. When we are believing that no one cares. Christ's arms are encircling us. When we are being pushed down mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, Christ is standing with us with his arms around us. There is a work which we must do if we would be prepared for the day of God. The Lord bids us gather yourselves together before the decree bring forth, before the day passes the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgments. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Now in probationary time is our opportunity to humble our hearts before God and receive his righteousness. Will we be able to receive his righteousness after probationary time has closed? Negative. Now is the time for us to receive from him his righteousness. While Jesus is knocking at the door of the heart, make thorough work of repentance. When do we see Jesus knocking at the door of the heart? Where do we find this within scripture? I stand at the door and knock. Um, Revelation? No. I can't think. We find this in Revelation 3, but Revelation 3 is a reference to what? This last three churches. Is not this portion, I mean, the, the, the big thing with, Re, with, with this, with Revelation, whether you were Martin Luther, John Calvin, many others, 
you accepted revelation as being necessary within the canon, canon of scripture. Yet, canticles or the Song of Songs, what we call also the Song of Solomon, was one of those books, along with James, that they wished to get rid of from the canon of Scripture. And the only reason that the Song of Songs is in the canon of Scripture is because we are given this imagery of the Beloved, that is knocking at the door and his beloved is inside. She has bathed. Her feet are clean. She is warm in her bed. She is asleep. But her beloved is outside the door. He's not just knocking. He is reaching through the slit in the door. He wants to be let in. For it is a storm outside. His locks are wet with dew. He is cold. He wants to be with his beloved. But his beloved. Is so comfortable that she does not wish to put herself out. Therefore, Christ stands at the door and knocks. Brothers and sisters, don't let this be an admonition that Christ stands at the door and taps. He's not just tapping at the door. He's banging at the door. Are we so comfortable that we can ignore the pounding at the door right now? Are we going to be like the beloved in the Song of Songs that finally comes to the realization that she needs to come to the door, but her beloved has moved on? Are we going to be as that beloved, going out into the city asking, where is my beloved? What actions are we going to take today? While Christ is knocking at the door of the heart, make thorough work of repentance. Take back what you have spoken against your brethren. Here is an admonition. If we have wronged our brothers, if we have wronged our sisters, we are to take back that which is spoken against our brothers, against our sisters. If we are unwilling to do this, we are not of Christ. Confess and forsake your evil speaking and turn to the Lord with heartfelt contrition. Let the education you have received be unlearned as soon as possible. If we are not willing to be educated by Miller's rules, we are not of Christ. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not where he goeth. Do not rest till you have surrendered to Christ soul and body and spirit. When you consecrate yourselves to him and abide in his love, you will be transformed in character. When your life is hid with Christ in God, your selfishness will disappear. Your heart will not then entertain pride or pettish, perverse feelings. Then you will not be so easily hurt. You will endure as seeing him who is invisible. 
the view of Christ will so attract and absorb your mind that you cannot fix your eyes upon any of these disagreeable things and manufacture burdens for your soul. Will you, for your soul's good, think of Jesus? Will you love him with your whole heart and mind? Will you bring to God an offering of righteousness? We are connected with Christ by faith. When we are connected with Christ by faith, we can no longer be fitful and selfish and exacting. We shall view our fellow men in a new light. The love of Christ flowing into the heart makes men kind and sympathetic and loving toward all. They have a different type of character, a Christ-likeness, a heart glowing with love because they are receiving the healing beams of the Son of Righteousness. God is taking away their sins. It is he who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy, thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Psalms 103, 3 and 4. Does this mean that when we love one another, that we can accept sin whenever we find it? No, that doesn't mean that. Sin is, ab is absolutely abhorrent to God. It is something we are to battle every day, every hour, every minute. God does not love the sin, but he has compassion upon the sinner. The God that ruleth in the heavens is our God. We have made a covenant with him by sacrifice. If we have made a covenant with him by sacrifice, have we not sought to enter into union with him by sacrifice? Yeah, well, isn't that a contract? Is it a contract? It is a covenant. It is a union. Before the decree bringeth forth, before the day passes the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord come, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgments, seek righteousness, seek meekness, it may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's fierce anger. <clears throat> Here again, were the children of Israel to enter into a covenant relationship with any of the nations that surrounded them? No. Were we, as a movement to enter into any type of covenant relationship with those that have rejected Miller's rules and the testimony of the true witness of Revelation 3. Again, that would be no. The Lord would have us increase our faith and hope and reliance upon him. Three steps, faith, hope, and reliance. Let us thank God that we have a refuge in which we may flee. 
We want more joy in the Lord. We realize his mightiness to punish. And we want to have a continually increasing assurance in his mercy, his love, his kindness and compassion to those who love and fear him. We want constantly the power, the fervor of the first love, the fresh luster of his beautiful garments of righteousness. We are to show forth the goodness of God. A corrupt union has been formed to tear down God's memorial of creation, the seventh day which he hallowed and blessed and gave to man to be assigned between God and his people to be observed throughout their generations forever. A corrupt union. Again, we are not to enter into any union. We are not to enter into any covenant. We are not to seek for ourselves to be joined in any manner with those that would tear down the memorial of God's creation. <clears throat> A period is coming when everyone will take sides between the Sabbath of the fourth commandment, which the Lord has sanctified and blessed, and the spurious Sabbath instituted by the man of sin. An idle Sabbath has been set up as the golden image was set up in the plains of Dura. And as Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, issued a decree that all who would not bow down and worship this image should be killed, so a proclamation will be made that all who will not reverence the Sunday institution will be punished with imprisonment and with death. Thus, the Sabbath of the Lord is trampled underfoot. But the Lord has declared, Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees and write grievousness which they have prescribed. Isaiah 10.1 The great day of the Lord is near. It is near. It hasteneth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord, and their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fires of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedy riddance of them that dwell in the land. Again, gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired, before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment, Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. The Lord of heaven permits the world to choose whom they will have as a ruler. Let all read carefully the 13th chapter of Revelation. 
for it concerns <clears throat> every human agent, great and small. Every human being must take sides, either for the true and living God, who has given the world the memorial of creation and the seventh day Sabbath, or for a false Sabbath instituted by men who have exalted themselves above all that is called God or that is worshiped, who have taken upon themselves the attributes of Satan in oppressing the loyal and true who keep the commandments of God. <clears throat> this persecuting power will compel the worship of the beast by insisting on the observance of the Sabbath he has instituted. Thus he blasphemes God, sitting in the temple of God, and showing himself that he is God. 2 Thessalonians 2.4 Our instruction is to read the 13th chapter of, of, of Revelation. What is it that we find there? We have a total of 18 verses. In Revelation 13. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. We are given an admonition. We are to read carefully the 13th chapter of Revelation. We are to carefully consider the symbolism that we find therein and the admonitions that are being given for us today. The worship of a false Sabbath is a wedge that split the Protestant churches from God and left them naked. How many of us would want to stand before the world, before God, naked? They had not a text of scripture to sustain their false god, but yet a deception, hoary with age, but still a deception, was commended to reverence and exalted. While the Sabbath of the fourth, fourth commandment was trampled upon and God was dishonored. The Bible was before them a plain, thus saith the Lord. And the penalty that is the part of the transgressor but as Adam and Eve and Eden listened to the falsehoods of Satan, so the righteous world are following their example. This wedge has split many from God. Just as we could see, looking from 723 BC to 1798. We have these two periods of pagan and then papal domination of the world. The pagan portion was that of an external desolation, the papal and internal desolation. From 1863, we can establish periods where there was an internal desolation within the church, within 
the church that had been a movement, where they chose to set aside the understandings of Leviticus 26, where they chose to set aside the 2300 days, where they chose to set aside the understanding of the daily. After that desolation, we then come to a period of external desolation that came upon that church. And every step that was taken was a step further and further into darkness. Because each were steps away from thus saith the Lord. The great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and hasteneth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty men shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men, that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy for he shall make even a speedy riddance of them, of all them that dwelleth in the land. Again, Gather yourselves together. Yea, gather together, O nation not desired, before the decree bring forth, before the day passes the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Manuscript 41, 1906. This admonition is repeated again and again. Here we are. As Mrs. White was writing this. As she continued. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Woe unto the inhabitants of the seacoast the nation of the Carathites. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, the land of the Philistines. I will even destroy thee, that there be, shall be no inhabitant. Zephaniah 1, 10 to 18, 2, 1 to 3, and verse 5. These conditions are to exist, and as a messenger whom God hath sent, I write these words of warning. Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, upon even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then will I turn to the people a pure language. That they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughters of my dispersed, shall bring mine offering. In that day shalt thou not be ashamed for all thy doings, wherein thou hast transgressed against me. For then I will take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy pride, and thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and a poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. 
The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies. Neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Zephaniah 3, 8 to 13. Mrs. White is again repeating the words that were given within Zephaniah. These are being repeated in 1906. Why is that important? I'm sorry, could you re repeat that? Why is it important that she was repeating these words in 1906? That was the year of the uh, earthquake in San Francisco. Exactly. Here again, God's judgments are upon the land. Many refuse to accept this. In many places, there exist conditions that make these words of warning applicable in this our day. Brothers and sisters, in many places, there exist conditions that make these warnings applicable today. Should not the terrible earthquake that has caused almost complete destruction of San Francisco, one of the largest cities of America, awaken a most earnest interest to seek the Lord while he may be found? Let not our ministers in their discourses dwell upon commonplace matters. Now is a time when there should be a humbling of the heart before God. Let us seek him while he is to be found on the pardoning side and not on the judgment side. Wake up, my brothers and sisters. You have no time to lose. I have no time to lose. Call upon the Lord while he may be found. Before it is forever too late, study the scriptures with, with prayer. Let all church members seek to speak the language of condemnation and begin to work intelligently to obtain the pearl of great price, the meekness and lowliness of him who took humanity upon himself. Here we have a definition of that pearl. Here we have the contrast. If we are speaking and condemning brothers and sisters, if we are pushing them away, not allowing them to speak, if we are refusing to consider points, oh, because they're so hard, because it's so difficult, because I don't wish to wake up, because I don't want to exert all of my mental energies upon this subject. All of this is the language of condemnation. All of this is not of Christ. We are being shown that we are not seeking to obtain that pearl of great price. We are seeing that we are choosing not to be partakers of that divine nature. Let there be heard no unkind comments about others. Let each one remember that his own case needs to be cured by a practice of the precepts found in the word of God. Let no soul exalt himself or herself. Let not one word be spoken to disparage others. Seek instead to speak words that will bring courage and hope to those 
who are perishing out of Christ. Let fathers and mothers seek together for the truths found in the word of God. Let them clothe their speech with the language of a converted soul and then with great earnestness and love encircle their children with the influence of truly sanctified hearts. The scriptures are to be to them the bread of life and their great lesson book. May the Lord help you to understand his word. If you will heed and practice this word, you will become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Let our ministers and our teachers seek knowledge from the one true source. This is not to be of science falsely so called, for it is Christ through his Father that is the bedrock of all true science. Let them seek the Lord with much prayer, earnestly searching his word to find the hidden treasure. Now, just now is the golden opportunity to understand the truths of the word and let this opportunity be improved by all. Let the book of Daniel be read and its instruction heeded. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Blessed is he that, walk, that waiteth and cometh to the thousand, three hundred, five and thirty days. But go thou, Daniel, thy way until the end be, for thou shall rest. And stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Daniel 12, 10, 12, and 13. Daniel is today standing in his lot. And we are to give him place to speak to the people. Our message is to go forth as a lamp that burneth. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they shall turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Daniel 12, verses 1 to 3. These words present the work that we are to do in these last days. We are not one half awake. If we are not half awake, are we yet not asleep? We have not the power that is essential to the doing of the work that must be done. We must come into life. We must come into union. We must come into unity. Now, just now, we must stand in that position where repentance and pardon shall be the striking feature of our work. There must be no quarreling. It is too late to engage with Satan in his work of blinding eyes. It is too late to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. What has Mrs. White said here? If we are choosing to quarrel, if we are choosing to cast out, if we are choosing 
that we're not willing to listen to the questions and observations of others. Are we not engaging with Satan in his work of blinding eyes? Whose side are we on? Whose banner do we stand under? Are we under the banner, the blood-stained banner of Prince Emmanuel, or are we under the black banner of the great apostate? It is indeed too late to give heed to seducing spirits and to the doctrines, the grapes of the devils. I am instructed to say that when the Holy Spirit gives tongue and utterance, we shall see a work done similar to that done on the day of Pentecost. The representatives of Christ will work intelligently. There will not be found one man here and another there seeking to tear down and to destroy. We need a clear understanding of the prophecies of Daniel. We need a clearer understanding of the prophecies in general so that we may more better instruct others. We have no time to be separated from brothers and sisters. We need the upper room experience. We need the unity of the disciples. For nine days, they met in the upper room. On the 10th day, the Spirit of God was poured out among them. And on that day, what we now call Pentecost, the 50th day, a message was given, a message was given to the entire church. How many were baptized on that day? 3,000, I think. Yet that was but a remnant of those of the church. Consider that for a moment. Before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. In view of what is soon to come upon the earth, I entreat you, brethren and sisters, to walk before God in all meekness and lowliness of mind, remembering the care that Jesus has for you. All the meek of the earth are exhorted to seek him. Those who have wrought his judgments are to seek him. Let self break in pieces before God. It is hard to do this, but we are warned to fall upon the rock and be broken else it will fall upon us and grind us to powder. It is to the humble in heart that Jesus speaks. His everlasting arms encircle them, and he will not leave them to perish in the hands of the wicked. Review and Herald, 19th of November, 1908. Isn't it interesting? How many years ago was this written? How many years ago was this published? Didn't you say it was written in 80, 
2. This was Review and Herald, November 19th, 1908. Oh, 1908. 114? Is it 114? Or is it 124? 114. 114? Okay. 4.11. The time of information. Because a 4.11 call is that not a, a call for information at this time? <laughs> That's what it would appear. <laughs> what is it to be a Christian? It is to be Christ-like. It is to do the works of Christ. Some fail on one point, some on another. Some are naturally impatient. Satan understands their weakness and manages to overcome them again and again. Let none be discouraged by this. Whenever little annoyances and trials arise, ask God in silent prayer to give you strength and grace to bear them patiently. To bear them patiently. There is a power in silence. Do not speak a word until you have sent up your petition to God of heaven. If you will always do this, you will soon overcome your hasty temper, and you will have a little heaven here to go to heaven in. Well, that sounds like an axiom to me. Okay. I mean, there it is, real plain. <laughs> There's a message right there. <laughs> exactly. Now, we are close to the close of our time together today. Do we have any other questions, observations, or comments? Do we have any other thoughts of things that we may need to consider? Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these words of instruction. We thank you for these observations, for these things that need to be corrected within our lives. We ask today, Father, for your blessing and your guidance. We ask, Father, for traveling mercies for those that must travel. We ask for your blessing upon those that will give presentation, whether in words or music. We ask, Father, for your direction and your guidance in all that we are to do. May your will be done. May that which we do bring glory to your character, <clears throat> bring glory to you. We thank you, Father, for this time that we've spent together. And we ask that you bring us again together so that we may learn more of you. For this we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.